Well, before I get started this morning, I just wanted to remind everyone, because it was on my heart watching that video there, how lucky we are as a church to be involved with things like this. We are so incredibly blessed that God would invite us to be a part of that. So anyone who does have spare time this afternoon, I would strongly encourage you, go spend time with Jason, spend time, find out more about what our church does, because we are incredibly lucky to be a part of these things. Uh, well, it's uh, coming up on that season of the year where we go and knock on strangers' doors and invite them to load our kids up on candy and sugar, despite the fact that the rest of the year we said, please don't do that to my kids. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's coming up on this time of the year. This is the first year my oldest son, Jonathan, is kind of old enough to really be excited about this. We've forced him into a costume for the last two years so we could take cute parent pics. But this year he's excited himself and he wants to go as Spider-Man. Uh, and uh, I, I have to admit, I'm a little envious because secretly I kind of want to dress up in a costume and go get free candy too. Uh, I know that that's a little embarrassing to admit as a 30-year-old, but I do, I do. And uh, I actually think about it a lot because uh, as some of you guys know, I've mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a big nerd. And the haven and the paradise for nerds like me is a place called Comic-Con. Comic-Con is a, a convention that gets together in San Diego every summer, uh, and a lot of people like me uh, who have repressed their childhood get to go and put on a costume, pretend to be your favorite superhero or movie character, get with everybody else, find out about the new movies coming out. It's a great place to go. I haven't gone. Uh, I wish I could go someday. But I was reading a story this last week as we are coming up on this season where kids get dressed up in costumes. Uh, and I was reading about a costume contest that went down at a Comic-Con one time. And it was a whole bunch of kids and different people who got together to dress up as Iron Man. Now, if you are unfamiliar, Iron Man is a superhero who puts on this amazing suit of technology so he can fly and do all the other things that superheroes do. And the kids love him. And there's a bunch of movies out about Iron Man. Uh, and so all the kids got together and made their costumes. Some of the kids did it out of cardboard. Uh, some kids went all out and bought something really expensive from a store. Uh, you actually had adults who would got a little too involved. They had a PhD in engineering and they'd built themselves this fully mechanical electronic suit. Uh, and so there was a whole host of different costumes and they were very, very impressive. But then something really special happened. I've got a picture here I want to show you. This is Robert Downey Jr. here on the right. He is the actor that plays Iron Man in the movie. And at this costume contest, as all the kids were lining up and some of those adults that were acting like kids lined up, uh, out comes Robert Downey Jr. So in the midst of all of these different costumes, in the midst of all of these different impersonations, the real deal shows up. And the kids get really, really excited. Now why do the kids get excited? It's because it's far better to have the true and authentic thing than it is to have an imitation. It's fun to dress up, it's fun to impersonate, but it's so much better to have the real thing. And that's a little bit of a glimpse into what we're talking about in Hebrews this morning. Because we're jumping forward, we're looking into chapters 8 and 9 this morning, and there's something really interesting that gets said in Hebrews 8. In Hebrews 8, the author of Hebrews says that they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. And what he's talking about there is he's talking about God's dwelling place. He's talking about the tabernacle and the temple, this place that God had given the ancient Jews and the ancient Israelites to worship him, and specifically to atone for their sin. And he's talking about the things that would go on in this dwelling place. Now before we get too far into this, I do want to remind you guys that this is a letter that is written to people just like us. And the reason I want to remind you is because reading this book as we continue to go through this series, it's really easy to read some of the things that we read in Hebrews and think this is for really heady people. This book might be for intellectuals and people who really love theology. And there's a lot of incredible stuff in there for university professors, but not for you and me. Not for the people on the ground. All this talk of high priests and sacrifices and religious rituals can get a little bit distant from us. But I want to remind you that the people that read this letter first, the people that this letter was addressed to were people like you and me. They weren't university professors. They weren't the leading scholars of Christianity in the day. These were average people in a church trying to follow Jesus in the midst of all the chaos that was going on around them. And they were suffering persecution. They were suffering all kinds of terrible things. These were people who needed real answers to real questions. They weren't reading this letter for fun. They were reading it because they needed to know 
the hope of the gospel. They were in a place in their lives where they needed to hear what God had to say to them. And so I encourage you this morning as we go through this and we look at some of the things that might feel a little bit beyond us or outside of our world, I want to remind you this is God speaking to us today. This is God offering us hope, offering us encouragement for the things that we go through. So let's go ahead and take a look. We're in chapter 9 this morning. If you want to read with me, we're going to read verses 22 through 28. This is what it said. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth, who went as the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again, ever since the world began. But now once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. So the first thing that I want to talk about this morning, the first thing that we see in this passage is the reality of our need and the reality of judgment. And this is kind of a little uncomfortable, but in verse 22, we're told something quite interesting. He says that according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now what he's talking about, to give us some context of what he means by shedding blood, he's talking specifically about this special occasion that would happen in the tabernacle, that would happen in the dwelling place of God called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, what would happen is the high priest, the leader of Israel's people, would come and he would put on his high priestly garments, he would come to the temple, and he first would take two goats. Now the first of those two goats was a goat that, that had the name Azazel. And Azazel is a Hebrew word that means fully removed. And it's where we get our word scapegoat. And you'll see sometimes in Bible translations it gets uh, translated as, as scapegoat. And the reason why is exactly what you would imagine if it's called a scapegoat. It's because the people of Israel would pray and confess their sins and they would trust that their sins would be put on this scapegoat. So the scapegoat would carry their sins and then they would send it off into the wilderness and they would tie a scarlet thread to represent their sin. And sometimes they would actually push it off a cliff because they wanted this scapegoat to die. They wanted it to take their sin and die so their sin would be removed and taken away from them. And then what would happen after that, because that wasn't the end of the many, many rituals of the Day of Atonement, is they would take the second goat and it would be sacrificed. And the high priest would take its blood and then he would sacrifice a bull. As we're on the third sacrifice now. And he would sprinkle that blood on himself, on his garments, just so that his sin could be forgiven enough for him to then enter into the Holy of Holies, to go into the place where God's presence was. And he would take the blood of that second goat and he would sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant and he would ask God to forgive the people of Israel. Now even regurgitating the, those things to you, I'm overwhelmed by the number of sacrifices and the amount of rituals that these people had to do in order to be right with God. And the reason why they did this, the reason why year after year they would repeat the same thing again and again and go through these extremely detailed rituals was because they believed that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness. It was absolutely fundamental to what they believed about God, that if their sin was to be dealt with, if their problem between them and God was to be resolved, there had to be the shedding of blood. And God had given these instructions. He told them exactly what to do. He laid them out in the book of Leviticus. We can even go back in our Bibles and see exactly what he told them. And so this was hugely important to them, massively important. Now, 
we might be tempted in our day and in our culture to look back on these people and say, well, that's barbaric. That's very strange. We would never do that. We don't believe that God would demand the blood of animals. But this is important. This is as much our faith as it was theirs. And there's something that we need to understand about this. There's something that we need to wrestle through in it. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, even though the idea of sacrificing animals and, and doing all these things that they would do may seem a little foreign to us, the underlying truth, I think we all agree with, and that's that there can't be any forgiveness without payment. That's what this verse is ultimately telling us when it says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. It's telling us you can't be forgiven unless something is done to resolve and pay for the wrong that was there. Now let me give you an analogy to try and uh, give you an explanation as to why I think that really we all believe this. If I was to take Pastor Bruce's car for a spin and I got a little reckless uh, and got myself into a car accident and then I came to Bruce and I said, Bruce, could you forgive me? I've wrecked your car. There's one of only two ways that Bruce can actually forgive me and it be true authentic forgiveness. Either one, I have to pay for the damage that I've done and Bruce forgives me or Bruce can forgive me without me paying for it, but in doing so, he is automatically taking on the cost of the damage that I've caused. He is absorbing the cost of that damage on himself in order to forgive me. It's not possible to just ignore the damage that's been done and just say, we're gonna sweep that under the carpet and you're forgiven. That's not real forgiveness. That's not true authentic forgiveness. True authentic forgiveness means that what was wrong is put right that the break in the relationship, the thing that's caused the problem is resolved. So that's why these people believe that. And that's why really we all believe it too. It's because we know that true justice demands that whatever is wrong has to be put right. This is how our entire justice system works. When we do things wrong, there has to be something that is done to correct that wrong. There has to be a payment. There has to be a consequence. So we all believe this in some measure or fashion. Now, it's easy to say, well, for religious people, we know what that is because we understand in the world of religion, when people believe religious things, it's really easy to pick out those things that we think we need to do in order to pay for our sin. Because there is a, a long list of things that we do on a daily basis to try and pay for our sin. But irreligious people as well, people who don't even believe in God, they will have their offerings and they will have their sacrifices too. They might not use those words and it might not look the same. They might not offer goats and bulls, but they are offering something because we all believe this. We all deep down know that there is a price to be paid when we do things wrong. And it might be a different God. It might be something else that you think that your life is owed to. It might be something else that you think you need to work for. But in the end, we are all making some kind of payment to someone for the things that are wrong in our life. It might be in our marriages. It might be in our jobs. It might be in our parenting with our kids. It could be one of a thousand things, but eventually in some way we all need to see that we are trying to work off and trying to make a payment to someone for our sin. Now here's the real problem in this passage. Because the real problem isn't simply that sin needs to be paid for. What happens is in chapter 10, when we move to the next chapter, something really interesting is said. It's said that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now this is a really strange thing to say because remember that it was God who gave these instructions. God was the one who said sacrifice bulls and goats to atone for your sin. That was his idea. But now the author of Hebrews is saying actually it's impossible for that to take away your sin. So we're caught in between the tension of two things. On the one hand we know someone has got to pay something for our sin. But we're being told that all these religious rituals that we have, all of these things that we do, all of these habits that we have to try and pay for our sin, they're not going to take away the sin. They're not going to resolve the problem. What he's telling us is that no matter how many mission trips we go on, no matter how many good deeds we do for other people, no matter how many times we come to church, no matter how many times we beat ourselves up and tell ourselves, we should be ashamed of what we've done. No matter how many times we point to the person next to us and say, well, I'm not like them. I haven't done what they've done, God, so cut me some slack here. None of that is going to take away our sin. 
because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin. So we're trapped. We're trapped in the middle of a conundrum. What do we do? Why did God give us this system in the first place? Well, in order to understand it, the author of Hebrews is going to point us somewhere else. Because what he's telling us is there is nothing under heaven that can take away our sin, but there is something from heaven. We're going to look at the beauty of Christ's work. Go ahead and read with me as we move on here, verse 24 through 26. This is what it said. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. I have a a checkbook with me this morning that uh, we're going to use to try and understand this a little bit better. Uh, If I was to take one of my checks and write a million dollars on here and throw it out there for some lucky person to grab, The only way that that check is going to be worth anything and that person actually gets a million dollars is if the account number at the bottom of the check is attached to an account with a million dollars. All this is, no matter how many bills we use it to pay for or how many things we use it to pay for, all this is at the end of the day is a book of paper with some numbers on it. It has absolutely no value in and of itself. It doesn't matter how many zeros I put on here, what my signature looks like, This can't pay for anything unless it's attached to an account. Now in the same way, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, we are told, were copies of something else that was to come. That they were pointers, they were foreshadowing of something else that was to happen. The author of Hebrews is telling us that these sacrifices, these animals, were always pointing towards something else. They were symbols of faith. If those sacrifices were like a checkbook, Then at the bottom, they had an account number, and that account number said Jesus. God gave these sacrifices, and he gave these rituals, not because they, in and of themselves, could do anything for us, but so that we would have a point there towards something that he was going to do, so that we could have some framework to understand how God was going to rescue us from the problem of our sin. That was always the plan the author of Hebrews is telling us. So when those priests offered these sacrifices, when they came together and they prayed and they had the scapegoat and they sacrificed the bulls, whether they understood it or not, because we're told that most of the time they didn't, they were making an offering in faith because of God's provision in the future. They were writing checks, trusting that at the bottom there was an account number that God had which he could pay for sin with. And that's who Jesus is. That's what we are told Jesus is. He is the fulfillment, the completion of everything that was there in the Old Testament. He is the true sacrifice. All of those other things were just a costume contest for Jesus. They were imitations, and he's the real deal. When Jesus comes on the scene, we're told about what he does for us and why it's so much more superior to what had happened in the Old Testament. Why what Jesus did for us is better We're told in verse 24 that he entered into a space not made by human hands like the temple was and the tabernacle was, but into heaven itself. See, the author of Hebrews takes pains to again and again, he says it several times in this passage that everything we experience on earth, all these rituals, all these religious things are just copies of some other great reality, of something else out there. But when Jesus came, he wasn't a symbol He wasn't a copy. He wasn't another imitation of something else. He was the real deal. He was what all those other imitation, those other costumes pointed towards. And when he came, he entered into heaven itself, appearing before God's very throne. You see, the high priest would have to go into a room that was made by human hands with an Ark of a Covenant that, though it was incredibly special and sacred, was ultimately made by human hands. But Christ walked into heaven itself. He offered himself to his Father, and he didn't do it with the blood of goats and bulls. He did it with his own blood, with his own life. 
voluntarily laid it down for the sake of the people that he loved before the throne of God. That's why he is better. That's why his work is infinitely more beautiful than any religious ritual that we might chase after. This is why even today in our churches, we need to constantly remind ourselves that it's not about the good things that we do. It's not about the mission trips that we go on. None of those can set us right with God. We have been set right with God by an act of grace, by an act of God's love for us. He did the work for us. And everything that we do is a response and a reaction to how incredibly loving he has been for having paid that debt apart from anything that we could do. The other reason why Jesus is so fantastic is because in verse 25, it says that he didn't enter heaven to offer himself again and again. You see, on the Day of Atonement, that was a holiday that was celebrated every single year. The same people would have to come back to the same place every year and offer again and again and again and again, never having any level of security that they were truly eternally forgiven. They always knew there's going to have to be another sacrifice. There's going to have to be another day where we come to the temple and we sacrifice and we give. And so they lived in perpetual fear of God's judgment because they never knew whether they'd done enough. They never knew, knew whether they were enough to please God. But Jesus comes and he doesn't offer again and again. The author of Hebrews says he doesn't go into heaven again and again. If he did, he would have to do it from the beginning of time till the end of time. Jesus, because his blood is so precious, because his life is so precious, that when he sacrificed his life, he did it once for all. This is what it says a little bit earlier in the passage, in verse 11. So Christ now has become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. The beauty of Christ's work is that it completes and stretches far beyond anything we could ever offer God. Every time we do something to try and please God, it is like standing in the middle of a park with the clouds above us and all of us jumping to see who can touch the clouds. None of us are getting any closer. Maybe I jump a couple of inches higher than the next person, but we're still all of us far, far away from doing what we're trying to do. Jesus is not far away. Jesus has done it once for all time. He has guaranteed and secured and made certain our redemption forever. This is why I love to preach the Bible. This is why I like to talk about Jesus, because this matters. Because all of us have this question deep inside of us. All of us feel the gnawing question inside of us that says, have I done enough? Am I enough? Is my life worth anything? Have I made enough of myself to please God? Well, the words of Jesus to us this morning are you don't need to because Jesus has already done it for you. That is the beauty of Christ's work. That's the beauty of Christianity. That's why this message offers more hope to everyone in the world than anything else. Because only Jesus, only Jesus has the answer to that question that we are all hoping for. Only Jesus has the verdict over our lives that we all desperately need. Only Jesus can put peace in our hearts and have us know that we don't need to be enough. He was enough for us. That's the whole reason he came. And he did it out of love and grace because that's how much he loved us, because that's how fantastic and glorious and incredible God is. He is not like us. He is the guy who when I wreck his car and wreck his world and hurt his children, he absorbs the penalty of my sin. He absorbs the cost of my sin. He takes it on himself so that he can forgive me as an act of grace. No forgiveness comes free. No forgiveness comes free. The only reason it doesn't cost us anything is because it costs Jesus something. That's something to keep in the back of our minds for the rest of our lives. This didn't come free. Grace is not free. It was paid by an act of love and mercy by God. 
Now, I told you that Christ's work gives us a certainty. It gives us a guarantee, and it does. And it gives us a guarantee of more than just the fact that sin has been dealt with. There's two things it gives us certainty of, and one of them is the certainty of our inheritance. This is what the last little section of this passage says. It says, Just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting for him. The first thing that is certain in our inheritance in Christ, if we trust in Christ, the first thing he guarantees is that we are 100% eternally forgiven. We have a really hard time with this because it's, it's easy to come into a church and talk about this message and say God forgives people, God gives grace to people. But to actually believe that, to know that, to trust in that when we walk out of this building is hard. I'll admit that I struggle every day of my life to truly believe that I'm 100% forgiven. Every time I prepare a message, every time I get ready to come and share, all I can think about is I'm way too sinful to be talking about Jesus. I'm a hypocrite. But what I need to go back to, and what we all need to go back to, is the fact that what Jesus has done has 100% paid for everything that we ever done. It's paid for past sins that we've done. It's paid for the future things that we need to still realize we need to say sorry for. It's covered it and everything in between. That's who Jesus is. If I went to the Hancock building, or the, uh, the Sears Tower, or Willis Tower, I forget what its name is now, uh, but if I went there on the top floor of both of those buildings or towards the top floor uh, in both of them, you can either go out on a glass platform and look straight down at the city, no floor beneath you except the glass, or you can go to the Hancock and you can stand on a little viewing platform that leans you forward like this to hang you over the city. Now, don't do it because you'll vomit. It's horrible. But if you were to go and you were to stand on that glass platform or you were to hang on that little... Uh, mechanism that it's got in the Hancock, what is going to hold you up, what is going to prevent you from falling to your doom at the bottom? Is it your level of confidence in the glass floor? Is it your level of trust in the mechanisms that hold you there? No, it doesn't matter whether I step, step on that glass floor and feel really shaky about it, or whether I step on it and have 100% confidence. In the end, what holds me there is the glass floor. In the end, what holds you and helps you to be forgiven is not your level of confidence in Jesus. It's Jesus himself. It doesn't matter how forgiven you feel, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. The second thing that Jesus gives us a guarantee of is our future inheritance. Not just an inheritance in this life, but of something to come. Now this made a, a big deal to the Hebrews that were re reading this for the first time. Because remember, they were in the midst of hardship. Some of them were dying for their faith. Some of them were being taken away, arrested, and martyred in, in some pretty horrific ways. So they needed hope that no matter what, that when they came to meet their maker, they would have an inheritance, that they would have something that they could go to, that there was a joy that awaited them, even despite the pain of this life. And that's what Jesus guarantees us. This is what it says earlier in the chapter in verse 15. It says, That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. When we trust in Jesus, he doesn't just forgive us here in this life. He doesn't just make our debt square with God. He purchases us as his own. We are adopted into his family and we get to have an eternity with him in his presence. When Jesus comes back, which he will, if we trust in Jesus, that's going to be a really, really good day. Because we are all of us going to enter into the joy of our master, into the joy and the delight of the one who loves us, who has served us, who has given himself for us. And he will invite us into his kingdom that has no more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more brokenness. That's what we get to be a part of in Jesus. Because he doesn't just redeem us. He redeems the whole world. Everything will be put right. Every broken thing. Every painful thing. Jesus will reshape it and remake it and redeem it all. 
And that's what he invites us into. That's what he was inviting the Hebrews into. That's what he's inviting us into again this morning. To be a part of this kingdom. To know him. To be assured that even death cannot take from us the joy that he wants to bring us. This is incredible stuff. So where I want to end this morning is I want to think about the dwelling place of God. This thing that the author of Hebrews has talked about in chapters 8 and 9. And I want to remember that it is a copy. That that tabernacle, that temple, all the religious rituals, all the religious practices, all of that is now closed for business. Because we don't need the copy anymore. We've got Jesus instead. We have the real thing. So let's not go back to the costume contest. Let's not go back to a dwelling place that's built on human effort and human hands and is just a copy. Let's go to the true Savior this morning. Let's go to the one who entered into a place not built by human hands, who went into a place that was built on a foundation of finished work, who went into the very presence of God and even this morning is praying for all of us by name. Let's chase that Savior. Because when we run to cheap imitations, all it will bring us is heartache, insecurity, and confusion. But when we come to Jesus, we will find rest for our souls. We will find a joy that never ends. And we'll find a Savior who will be faithful to us in every season of our lives. Would you guys pray with me this morning? Father, I love you. I love your church. We are so thankful for the foundation that everyone in this room is sitting on right now, which is your finished work. It is because of what you did that we can come in this building and sing and celebrate and have joy and have peace. And God, I pray that in, even in those places in our heart where we, we distrust and we struggle and we doubt, God, renew our faith this morning. Renew our faith as you did the people who received this letter for the first time to believe that you are the true and better dwelling place where we can find rest for our souls. God, we love you and we pray in your son's name. Amen. Before we finish this morning, I want to remind you that if there is any place we can pray for you, support you, encourage you, don't miss the opportunity to come and speak with one of us. We want to love you, we want to be there for you because this is what this message is all about. But as we close, let me offer this morning's benediction. Let us all of us go in the name of the God who is not a cheap imitation, who is not a costume, but is the true and authentic Savior who can bring rest to our souls and take us into the true and better dwelling place. It's in the name of that Savior that we go this morning. Amen. Amen.